There you go. Well, good morning, everybody, to our intimate conversation on equitable transit-oriented development in the city of Chicago. Um, this is being convened by Chicago Studies. For those of you who don't know us, Chicago Studies is a program of the college that collaborates closely with a number of the urban-facing programs on campus to offer curricular and co-curricular opportunities to study, discover, engage with, and hopefully positively impact the diverse communities that make up our city and the region that surrounds us. Um, today, we are so fortunate to be joined uh, by Newton Barani and by Roberto Requejo. Newton is the Associate Director of Design and University Partnerships at Arts and Public Life, a division of UChicago Arts. And for those of you who have done any classes in the Architectural Studies program, you also know her as the instructor of some amazing studio classes, uh, in particular one that's coming up in the winter about the architecture of memory that is going to be simply brilliant. Uh, Roberto Requejo is the program director of Elevated Chicago, which partnered with the city to convene the working group and cohort that informed the entire process and policy plan that we're going to be discussing. In Newton's words, Roberto, quote, lives and breathes all the various efforts that led to this policy plan and was an integral part of it all. So I'm really excited to make his acquaintance and really grateful that he was able to join us today. I'm going to hand it over to Newton and uh, let's talk about policy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris, for the introductions. I'm very excited to um, be here with everybody today. I'm going to share screen um, just to give you a little bit of a background of um, what we are um, all about. Let's see if I get the right slides here. All right, can everybody see that? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, arts and public life and how we're connected to this. Um, you know, how can this arts organization be um, connected to this policy? And it's, it's, um, it's actually all about our civics. So thank you all for being here and um, for listening to all of this and um, hopefully in participating in our, um, in the ordinance comments. So um, as Chris said, my name is Nuthan Barani. I'm the Associate Director of Design at Arts and Public Life. Um, so Arts and Public Life is an initiative of UChicago Arts. We're providing platforms for artists and access to arts programming through artist residencies, artist-led programs and exhibitions, arts education, and creative entrepreneurship. We're located off campus in the Washington Park neighborhood. We're in the 300 East block of Garfields Boulevard. Our programming occurs in three main buildings, um, but really all um, across the block, including the outdoor spaces. So our anchor space here at the Arts Incubator is at 301 at the corner of Garfield and Prairie. The Green Line Performing Arts Center is, uh, has just opened um, just two years ago. We've had about a little bit more than a year of programming there before, um, before the lockdown for the pandemic. And um, very soon to be open, as soon as we're able to open all of the spaces on the block, a retail space um, in the historic Green Line Station, actually the Garfield Green Line Station, the, the first one that was um, the first uh, original Garfield Green Line Station, now a historic building, it will be a retail space um, hosting three fellows of the L1 Creative Business Accelerator. And that really brings me to, you know, our proximity of how we're related to this whole ordinance and to elevated Chicago completely. So um, again, here's the block, the 300 East block of Garfield Boulevard. The green line runs uh, right through here um, and the retail space uh, directly underneath those tracks. All right, so elevated Chicago, what is it? Elevated Chicago is a cohort of 17 different organizations, uh, organizations that serve the city as a whole, like uh, Metropolitan Planning Council and organizations that are primary, primarily local and community and neighborhood based, such as Garfield's Park Community Council. All of these organizations are coming together toward really this goal of racial equity with the lenses of public health climate resilience, and arts and culture. And we're focusing this work in geographical areas related to train stations, seven different CTA train stations. Um, of course, uh, 
arts and public life associated uh, geographically right um, next to the Garfield Green Line station, as I mentioned. So APL is on the steering committee of Elevated Chicago. Uh, we work in a number of different capacities. We're also, of course, on the local committee um, around these Green Line um, stations on the south side. Um, I have to say, I don't think that there is a better example in the city of a mix of organizations that are coming together in a truly, truly inclusive way to think upon and act upon civic issues. And of course, the, uh, one of the biggest initiatives is this ordinance um, uh, for our focus right now. Um, and here to discuss more detail, um, as Chris also um, introduced Roberto, um, he's not only the director of Elevated Chicago, but he is the person who wrangles countless folks who have even more countless opinions and opportunities um, regarding equity in our city and how to go about it. Um, probably the person with one of the most challenging and interesting posts ever. Um, and my friend and colleague, Roberto de Quejo. Um, so I will stop share and turn it over to you. You should be able to share, Roberto. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nud and Chris, for a very generous um, introduction. And uh, I'm honored to be here today with all of you to um, not only to present the plan, but also would love to gather as much feedback as, um, as we can for the policy plan. The city of Chicago has uh, been very flexible with us and allowed anything that we do to count as public comment. So whether you uh, write something on the chat box, post something with the hashtag TTOD, call the phone number they have, send an email, all of that counts. So uh, very happy to be here today and thank you again, uh, Chris and Nut for uh, inviting me. Uh, one thing that I'm gonna ask before I uh, um, share my screen is I would love for all of you to go to the chat box and put there your name, uh, the neighborhood you live in, and uh, one thing, a, one place that you use public transit to access very often or most of the time or always. Thank you, Nut. Thank you, everyone, for, for sharing. Please don't be shy and share um, with the group. I see a lot of Hyde Parkers, obviously. And yes, I also miss the times where I could take the train to go places more often. Michael, although, um, I, I go everywhere saying the same thing. Um, public transit is probably one of the safest ways of transportation during the pandemic. And we haven't, fortunately, and I'm uh, knocking on wood, found any um, spreading event in any major transit line anywhere in the US. So it um, turns out that if people wear masks and stay quiet during the trip and don't touch anything, they'll be safe and sound. So, um, so thank you for sharing. Uh, I see a lot of folks who use it for going to the library to go downtown, family in the north side, uh, museums, conservatory. Uh, we're very lucky in Chicago to have a, a public transit system, uh, but it's also a system that is underutilized. Um, and that's why we came together in Elevated Chicago to find uh, all the ways that we can make the most of our, our transit system. And now while I have you all engaged, um, if you have access to the um, thumbs up um, fun uh, function here, I would love for those of you who love your neighborhood to give it a thumbs up. I see thumbs going up. Very cool. Wow, a lot of people love it in the neighborhood. So, uh, for, so for those of you who have uh, done that, uh, if you love where you live, it's probably because your neighborhood was designed to connect you with what you need, um, connect you through the train, but also connect you by walking 
distance to a grocery store, a theater, a bar you like, your friends, etc. That is not the case for all the neighborhoods in Chicago. So uh, a, I, I love that you all love your communities, or many of you love your communities. I love mine. It's a very transit-rich neighborhood in Chicago, Edgewater. But that is not a, a case of many of our neighborhoods. And what we're doing in Elevated and with this policy plan is to work together to design a Chicago that is more equitable with policies, with programs, and investments to end concentrated poverty and racial segregation and expand opportunities for jobs, for safety, and for education. And uh, really, uh, at the end of the day, would love a world where the next time I ask this question, all the thumbs go up, whatever I'm at, whatever the meeting is uh, in the city. Um, uh, equitable TOD, or equitable transit-oriented development, uh, advocates for people of all incomes and, uh, and racial backgrounds to experience the benefits of denser, mixed-use, pedestrian-oriented development near transit hubs as uh, Newt was uh, describing. And we think it's very important to do this at this time because with equitable TOD, if you do it um, right, and if you remember the slide that Newt showed with the different lenses of Elevated, uh, ETOD projects can address all the crises that are coming at us right now. In Chicago, climate change, racial justice, public health, jobs, all of this comes together in these, in these projects. Just to give you one example, uh, all of you are familiar with the fact that um, the people who get really sick with COVID-19 and uh, many folks who unfortunately die of COVID-19 have uh, pre-existing conditions. And many of those pre-existing conditions are closely connected to very car-oriented lifestyles and very car-oriented neighborhoods and folks who don't have options and they have to drive everywhere. And in doing that, not only they are uh, less active themselves or more prone to obesity, to diabetes, uh, but also um, they are contributing to pollution. And with that, you have more emissions. And with that, your lungs get sicker. And some communities have a lot of that uh, going on. So all of these pieces come together in our project to try to develop a different Chicago where we address all these problems at the same time. So as I mentioned before, we are all about building four transit and four people and not four cars or not having cars as the main uh, goal. Uh, as you know, this, the US is very car centric. So this is an uphill uh, battle, but one that more and more people are joining. And transit oriented development is exactly that, right? Like building uh, near transit building communities that are denser and more compact. Uh, but we also want to show you what, uh, what ETOD and is and what is not ETOD, right? And the E, as you all know, it stands for equity and equitable. Uh, on the left side, I don't know if any of you has been to this uh, very cool station, is the last or the first, depending on how you count, station of the red line located at 95th and State. It's a $280 million investment in that community. It has even has a DJ booth in there, uh, but there has been no development around it. So when CTA developed the site, they gave this amazing gift to the community, but no one came around and provided support for housing, for commerce, small businesses, community centers, daycare, nothing, open space. So they plopped this investment and, and without development around it. And it's really a, a, a wasted opportunity that we're working on with community partners. On the right side, there's an opposite example of what a, a ETOD is not, right? Here, um, for those of you who are familiar with Logan Square, um, there's been a lot of transit-oriented development that looks like those buildings uh, that you see there, tall um, uh, glass uh, towers, a very unaffordable with studios starting at thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars uh, a month, a, and units being very small. So uh, people with uh, families, uh, long, uh, large families, cannot uh, live there. Also, even if they could afford it. So um, the um, community uh, is still a very vibrant majority Latino community, but it's slowly and steadily uh, disappearing due to displacement. So those, uh, those um, businesses you see on top who are Latino owned uh, have left uh, the community unable to afford the rents um, 
that the the, the market um, is is creating. So uh, this map here shows you where TOD is taking place in Chicago and where it's not taking place. Uh, there is an ordinance in Chicago that dates back to 2013 that gives developers incentives to build near transit. So basically, if you are a developer, you have a project, you build it uh, near a transit station, the city allows you to do two things that are going to save you a ton of money or give you more money. One, you can build taller and bigger buildings next to transit, so you can have more units and sell more of that. Two, you don't have to provide one parking spot per unit, which is the, the usual mandate you can provide as little as no parking. So you save a ton of money because as a developer, parking is a very expensive thing to provide. With those incentives uh, left um, at the whims of the market, um, the, the impact has been what you see on that map on the left. And for those of you familiar with Chicago, uh, you probably know that the vast majority, 90% of those developments are located in the uptown Edgewater communities, in the Northwest side, in Logan Square, in particular and the near west side as well as in the loop and the west loop i'm sure all of you have been to the west loop and know how cool the neighborhood is but also how unaffordable it has become and you see also a small pocket where um Nut lives which is the pilsen a neighborhood that is also becoming a highly gentrified area so a 90 percent again of tod happening in that area and the rest of chicago having very very little TOD, including your neighborhood, Hyde Park, and adjacent neighborhoods like Washington Park, where Arts and Public Life is located, or Woodlawn, where the next um, presidential center will be open. So what does ETOD look like? Uh, so as opposed to those two types of investment that I show you in the prior slide, we want ETOD to look like these two examples that we have going on right now in Chicago is sponsored or participated by our members in Elevated. On the left side is the Emmett Street project. This is 100 units of uh, family uh, size affordable housing located next to the Logan Square Blue Line station. Uh, on the other side it's uh, Garfield Green which is uh, um, affordable housing and mixed use uh, development located next to the Ketzian Lake station of the Green Line, very close to uh, the um, Garfield Park Conservatory that uh, Brandon mentioned in the chat box. And the idea would be um, to create a very green, very sustainable uh, community in walking distance to several train stations, including the Green Line, but also the Blue Line um, from there. And both of them with very uh, intense community engagement in the process and a lot of affordability and community ownership options for both uh, residents and small businesses. So, um, so what did we uh, decide to do in Elevated when we came together about three and a half years ago and wanted to address the inequity of Chicago and the, the, the uh, contradictions of this map? So we, um, in, 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 in addition to support the place-based work that Nud mentioned in the different hubs that we serve, we also knew we had to change the system and one of the things that we needed to do is to uh, reform the ordinance that was providing the incentives for transit-oriented development. At the time, Mayor uh, Emanuel was in charge and uh, we approached him and his administration to do two things uh, in the new, in a reform of the TOD ordinance. The first thing we asked him is to expand the areas eligible for TOD incentives and include also bus routes because as you probably know many communities in Chicago don't have train stations but they do have bus routes so we wanted to make more communities uh, eligible for TOD but more importantly we also asked the city to pass a new ordinance that required the city of Chicago to develop a policy plan to make TOD more equitable we were successful in passing that the ordinance in January 2019, I think it passed with only one of the 50 votes uh, against. And um, uh, during the mayoral transition of uh, Mayor Lightfoot, we were invited to join her transition. Um, uh, I was honored to serve as a co-chair of her uh, transit, transportation infrastructure um, committee. 
and we made sure that ETOD became a priority in the final report. So when you look at the report that the transition committees put together, you'll see there is one section that is all about ETOD that our partners helped uh, develop. And with that, once the new administration was in place, once the new Department of Planning and Development, Housing, Public Health, Transportation were um, up and running with the new leaders, we met again with them and said, let's put together a working group that is really reflective of the spirit of the ordinance and the spirit of Elevated. So we started with a small group of eight, 10 people, half from the city, half from Elevated. And the group started to meet and grew. And that's something that Elevated does very often. We start small and then we, at the end of the project, we have like 100 people that came from everywhere, just wanted to help. Um, we put together two virtual workshops over the summer and we developed this policy plan that includes 36 recommendations to make uh, Chicago more equitable leveraging uh, transportation. And I would say that the process was very um, inclusive. We had of those 80 stakeholders, probably more than half came from community-based organizations and advocacy groups uh, interested in, in equity um, throughout the city. And something very important that we bring everywhere we go is the role of art. So uh, most of the times when you see a policy document, you see a document that is really hard to read and is boring and is too technical. And if you show it to your mom or your dad or your friends, I wanna be like, I don't wanna even open this. Uh, so we knew that was not what we wanted to do and we invited local artists to be um, very engaged, not only to make it beautiful, but also to make sure that the voice of the arts and culture community was front and center and they also um, participate in the decisions that the working group had to make. So with that um, came also an opportunity that we uh, had by working with the Chicago Community Trust, one of our funders, and the Funders Network for Smart Growth, who also gave us a grant to not only have a beautiful plan, but also to be able to implement it. And our community-based partners often tell us, please don't uh, plan us, please don't give us another planning grant, please do not research us, please do not take pictures of us. What we need is for you to help us build the community projects that we want to build. So with that accountability in mind, we told them, we make sure not to plan you again, and we'll make sure that we um, help you build all the bricks and mortar projects that you want to develop. So uh, if you haven't um, read the plan yet, it has three main buckets of recommendations. One bucket is about helping build the city's capacity to support equitable transit-oriented development. As many of you know, if you're following the news, the city has a significant budget uh, deficit and crisis right now. So getting dedicated staff is very hard because they are doing layoffs and things like that. Uh, but we know it's very important that the city reconfigures itself to provide uh, community groups, developers, everybody, uh, an office of transit-oriented development that exclusively focuses on making this happen. Because right now, the responsibility resides in five or six different departments and 10 or 20 people scattered across the city, so it's really hard to, to, um, to work uh, that way. Formalizing the working group is another recommendation. Um, creating an annual state of ETOD report to show the city every year, um, the residents, if we are making progress or not. And also community engagement standards are really important uh, uh, for us. We published a document a couple years ago with what Elevated Chicago thinks community engagement uh, should look like in Chicago and the expectation would be that the city um, uh, took that on and implemented those, those principles. That's one of the buckets. The second bucket is about making ETOD required, easier and more equitable. So for that, we are proposing to create an overlay zoning district. So that, that would be a zoning uh, denomination that would apply to all um, a, all a land in the city that is within half a mile of a transit station. And with that, we would make TOD more mandatory because right now it's voluntary. And that means that if you're a developer and you go to a transit station and you build next to it, there is nothing that precludes you from building a parking lot or, 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 or from building one parking spot per unit in an area that doesn't need it, right? 
So we don't have anything in place right now that requires you to make the most of the land and the, and the proximity of the land to transit. And we wanna make sure that that's, that's in place. We also wanna make sure that the city gives extra points to developers that are competing for funding. So you come with a beautiful community center proposal and there's a limited amount of dollars and there's a lot of people asking for them, you should get extra points for your transit oriented clinic, community center, affordable housing, this incubator, whatever that is. Um, and also pedestrian infrastructure. Um, many of you uh, know that uh, the fact that you are next to transit doesn't mean that that is uh, transit oriented. Um, women, people of color, the LGBT community has told us many, many times that they don't feel safe in walking to and from the stations and sometimes even at the station. So we wanna make sure that pedestrian infrastructure is in place and it's not just about the sidewalk, it's also about the lighting, it's about the art, it's about having eyes on the street, people walking all the time or uh, businesses open. So uh, very important that the plan uh, provides also that type of infrastructure and also that the developments that are building a transit include affordability and accessibility components because uh, for uh, folks with um, disabilities and especially folks who use wheelchairs, sometimes the train station is not accessible. Sometimes the train station is accessible, but the buildings nearby are not. Sometimes the buildings and the station are accessible, but the sidewalk is a mess. So that is not how we want things to, to look like. We want uh, the accessibility lens to be applied throughout uh, the station areas. And then finally, the third uh, bucket is about embedding ETOD into the next citywide plan uh, for Chicago. Um, the prior comprehensive plan that the city embarked upon dates back from 1966, if you can believe this. So we have not had a, have a comprehensive plan ever since. And as you can imagine, you go and read that plan, it's very car centered, is very downtown oriented, racial equity is nowhere to be found, climate change is not even a thing. So it's, um, it is a new plan that's starting this year and we have approached the city and told them this plan has to be the complete opposite. We want it to be centered in racial equity and we want it to be centered in uh, transit, not on cars. So, um, so this is the high level uh, overview of the plan. Some of the um, things that it took to get there is, of course, lots of patience, um, balancing technical and lived experience. Uh, for those of you who, who are very connected with universities and I've been, uh, I work for universities before, we often forget that the people who know best what the solutions are, are not the technical experts or the people with the PhDs, are the people who live in the community. And we often, come up with solutions thinking that technical experts alone will help us. Uh, we think that at minimum half of the people at the table have to be community residents affected by the issues and bring those voices uh, to the table with their solutions. Um, compensating those voices is really important. A lot of people of color are invited to tables to provide their um, expertise and bring um, diversity and equity to the table and paid nothing, so that is not acceptable uh, for us. So all of our community-based partners receive grants just to be sitting at the table, because that's time that they're putting into it. We want the city to institutionalize that and foundations and others to do that too. And then an open and transparent partnership with the mayor's office was really important. Uh, from the mayor to the staff, to the commissioners, they all have made statements about this being a priority for them and commitments to be transparent and open throughout the process, even when there is an instance of conflict, we want that to be in the open, not to be have these conversations under closed doors. And as I mentioned before, talented writers, activists, artists, really important. And then uh, national partners uh, have been critical for us. We have five sister cities. I don't know if any of you is from any of those, but uh, in addition to Chicago, another five cities are doing work like this together in a coalition throughout uh, the US in, uh, in San Francisco, LA, Denver, Atlanta, and Memphis. So um, before we start the conversation, I wanna just remind everyone the public comment period is open until October uh, 29th. As I mentioned before, the city is very open to all kinds of, um, of um, public comment formats. 
if you want to read the, the whole plan and write an entire paper and novel about it, you are welcome to do that and send it. If you just want to tweet, good job, that's good, just hashtag ETOD. If you have a specific issue that you are particularly caring about because you care about climate change or you care about people in wheelchairs or we care about sidewalks or you care about affordability, you can also just have one specific recommendation for that. And all those options, the email address, the phone, um, number, the hashtag are, um, are equally uh, considered by the city. And also, if you want to have your own meeting with your friends or colleagues, somebody else, you can access that link that I put at the beginning of the meeting on the chat box, uh, which includes uh, not only our um, uh, Zoom backgrounds, but also materials that you can use at those conversations. You have talking points, you have this presentation, and um, and you also have the plan on the website of the um, city, shy.gov slash ETOD in seven languages and also accessible for people with visual uh, disabilities. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop here and pass the mic again to Nut to help us facilitate a conversation. We'd love to hear your comments, concerns, questions about the plan. Absolutely, thank you, Roberto. That was that was great. Um, maybe we'll, let's leave this slide up for a few minutes. Um, and I am going to expand everything here so I can see everybody. Um, we talked earlier, we could probably, uh, I think we're a small enough group that if you um, have a question or a comment that you'd like to just kick off some discussion, um, go ahead and, and let's hear it. And then we'll see uh, how things are uh, uh, going from there. Anybody want to? Um, Give it a start, a question, some clarifications. Hi, I had a, um, I had a question for you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was great to hear the overview. Um, but I live in Lincoln Park, and um, what has been really driving me completely crazy is the tendency around here to convert multifamily housing to single family housing right next to transit stops. And I wondered if there was anything, which seems to me just a terrible idea, um, is there anything in the plan that addresses that problem? Um, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna go and assume that um, we have several examples of that um, going on right now. So I would say for the examples going on right now, I strongly encourage you to reach out to the aldermen and community-based groups to stop that from happening because uh, we agree that is not the best use of land near transit. Uh, but in the plan, uh, when we talk about this overlay zoning district here, is because we know that uh, that kind of stuff is happening and it's happening in Lincoln Park and it's happening in Edgewater in Uptown it's happening everywhere and so uh, it's happening because the zoning code and the land use uh, plan of the city allows for it and not only allows for it but it also makes in many areas single family housing the preferred use so there are cities like Minneapolis for instance that have uh, issued um, policies and ordinances, uh, first of all, banning exclusive single family housing uses from the entire city. So many areas in Minneapolis and in Chicago are uh, zoned exclusively for single family. So if you don't build, uh, you don't have a, um, a single family project, you cannot build there, right? So we wanna make sure that the zoning district, this overlay, would apply for to transit rich areas, which means, you know, we get it that if you wanna have more of a suburban style or a single family kind of feel uh, away from transit, go ahead and do that. But near transit, developers should be able to build um, um, a multifamily that is um, balanced, right? We don't want a huge tower next to a single family home. That's not what we're talking about, but something that makes sense in the context. And also that there are penalties for folks who are building a, or, or demolishing um, a, a multifamily and building single family. 
Uh, one more example of things that Elevated is doing is one of our community tables. So the same way that NUT is uh, located in our Green Line South community tables, we have one in Logan Square where community partners have uh, passed a uh, moratorium on demolitions all around the 606 um, a trail, which many of you are familiar with, because that uh, issue um, that you are mentioning uh, it was happening very often over there. So they were able to get the moratorium and the idea would be that uh, uh, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna pay a huge demolition fee. So we're gonna make it very difficult for you to to that type of uh, the type of development in that community. So yes, I'm, this is some of the ideas that we are uh, putting together. What is really important again is if it's something immediate that you need to address uh, ASAP, that you go to your local government and you organize with your community to stop it. And also through this process that you send us your, um, your comment on that. And uh, that concern is sent to the mayor's office makes a difference because you're not gonna be the only one bringing that up. Thank you. I'll also, I'll also add to that, Roberto probably um, doesn't even know about this other uh, conversation happening, um, but I've been in conversations with some of our Elevated Chicago partners around what it is and what it means to preserve the original Chicago affordable housing, which is that two flat, that three flat, that six flat, um, the original fabric of our city and what does it mean and how can we preserve those properties so that they remain affordable for the generations of families that have owned them instead of having to turn them over um, out of, you know, not being able to afford to keep them up um, as, as the, they get passed down through generations. So Emily, that's another conversation we'd be happy to talk with you about more sometime. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I've got a, a question-ish, maybe a halfway comment, halfway question. Um, super, super exciting. I'm 100% on board with all of this, but, but I know that historically when developments are proposed that have either very limited or no parking, um, existing neighbors are often concerned about the impacts on their own ability to park the cars that they already have. Um, is there anything in this plan to kind of address that or, or what kinds of things would you say to people in existing communities who have that concern? Yeah, thank you. That is one of the, um, I'm sorry, your name? Uh, Michael Gorman. Michael. Um, so Michael, that's, that has come up very often. It comes every single time that in, there is an affordable housing development or any kind of housing development into, into a community. Um, I'll use the example of Emmett Street, for instance, uh, the one that I showed earlier in the conversation in Logan Square. That was, this is a building that will be built on a parking lot in Logan Square. And um, there's a part of the argument that we need to do that, um, that is about the data, right? And showing the community residents the actual data of parking occupancy throughout the day, in many cases, um, what the numbers show is that lots of parking in the city goes unutilized for a very large amount of time during the day and you only need it in peak times. And so does it really make uh, sense to use that space for that next to a train station? And can we find alternative locations for those one time moments like a fair or an event or something like that? So. Uh, so first of all, we have in the group on Elevated Chicago Center for Neighborhood Technology. They have written extensively about parking in Chicago and produced data. They even did surveys going at different times of the day to parking lots across the city to show aldermen, communities. Here's what this parking lot looks like at 7 a.m., at 7 p.m., at 2 p.m. on a Saturday, on a weekday. And um, so part of what we're doing, or we have to do is be better at the data, right? And show the community, okay, here's, here's the data that shows how parking is needed in this community and your, your streets. But the other part of this argument is emotional too. A lot of folks have an emotional attachment to their cars. We all have an emotional attachment to parking and we all have horror stories about parking in our neighborhoods. And we also have to speak to that part, right? And that's why the role of artists and communication experts 
and um, poets is so important for Elevated because in addition to those numbers, you have to provide people the, 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 the connection, the emotional connection to why we feel so strongly about this area. And yes, maybe once or twice, you're gonna have to uh, drive around for a minute to find a parking spot. But we wanna show you with, with uh, poems, with pictures, with stories, what is it like to not be able to live in this neighborhood? What is it like to be homeless? What is it like to have three, four kids and, and not being able to find a spot in the community where your mom and your grandma lived for many years, right? And is your inconvenience about parking that one type of the month or is your inconvenience that you took that one weekend when you wanted to park for that party and you arrived late, is that commensurate to the pain that our families are going through in Lincoln Park, in Edgewater, in Uptown, to keep uh, themselves in the community and keep the kids in the school and keep getting to the job that pays minimum wage that allows you to stay in that neighborhood. So, uh, so Michael, that is a hot spot and a hot topic. We don't have the solution yet, but we do have those two very strong components of making the case both for the heart and for the minds. And by the way, all of you interested in helping us out, you are welcome to join us and help us make these cases. That was a great answer, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions, mm -hmm. comments, concerns? And you are welcome to say, I don't know how this makes sense for me. You know, if you have not seen how this affects you personally, that's fine to say and we'll, uh, We'll find a way to to connect with your needs as a as a Chicago resident. Hi, yeah, uh, Roberto. I just had a quick question about something that you mentioned about the uh, red line station at Ninety Fifth and State, and how it is uh, difficult for for transit oriented development to happen. And I can imagine that being the case actually through through most of the red line um, south of the city, just because of the the nature of how the red line is built with highway on both sides. And I was wondering what kinds of fundamental challenges that brings and some of the ideas to work around that. Uh, sure, and I have to apologize. I have lost the names of everyone that is on camera. I can see those of you without the camera's names, but so your name is? Uh, I'm Peter, I'm from Hyde Park. Hi, Peter, um, great to meet you. So uh, the situation at 95th and State uh, and in every community in the south and the west sides in Chicago, it's, it's better understood when you go back a few decades, right? And you put it in the context of, you know, redlining, in the context of uh, predatory lending, in the context of disinvestment um, and white flight that took place in many of those communities. So first of all, um, in, and uh, my dream would be that every community meeting starts with that, right? That we give a little bit of context before we go into what's the issue of the day, that we start, this is what's been going on here for the last 50 years, right? And, and what's been going on in that community is a constant, con continuous disinvestment um, and zero connection from uh, downtown interests other than to take from the community, right? So here we are, is you know, the 21st century, the community, um, receives this investment. So first challenge to answer your question was the community was never involved in that decision. So our colleagues in, in, in 95th and State, if you don't know, and the Leo Institute is the organization that we work more closely with there. It's a nonprofit organization connected with a local church, was never in the decision-making tables. The engineers and the planners and the city executives and the federal government folks never put them at the center. So can you imagine that, right? Like they are put, they're putting this huge investment and you are not their priority. You know, their priority is their own plan and their own uh, mentality. So that was the first challenge. The second challenge is that when you made the decision, now the community comes and says, what are you doing? And you as a transit authority, because Chicago is very segregated and it's not only race, it's also very siloed, our transit authority, when we first met with them, and they're great partners, by the way, and they have become really close to us. They have changed a lot through our partnership. But when we first met with them, and we told them what we wanted to do in, in Chicago, they told us, but I, I don't, that's not my job to do what you are saying. My job is to move people from A to B. 
right? That's, that's what I'm at here. And this is my priority. And just doing that takes an inordinate amount of time and effort. And it took us several years to tell them, but CTA, it doesn't matter that you move people from A to B if A and B are leaving the city. If your A and B are inequitable, your A and B are unsafe, your A and B are losing residents. And so through that process, they decided to realize, you know what? We need you because uh, those folks are also our riders, our passengers, our income, you know, is, is there. So, so the second challenge was to bring the transit authority to understand that the primary role of a transit authority is moving people. But the secondary role, very important, is to make sure that whatever they do activates the communities where the stations are and serves that community around it. And then I would say another, um, another uh, challenge has been that in Chicago, um, the more, the closer you are to downtown and the closer you are to white interests, the more power you have, right? So the farther you go from that center of power, the more problems you're going to find to, um, to find your voice and find your way in. So uh, our colleagues in Endaleo Institute are located in an area that is called the far south of Chicago for a reason, because it's really far, not only in distance, but in power access. So um, areas that are closer to hot spots, like areas like Woodlawn, for instance, are very close to a hot spot called the University of Chicago, right? Or um, a Garfield Park, which is very close to the West Loop, another hot area. They, got, they get closer access to power and get more attention than folks like Andaleo, who are located in Washington Heights. 90% of Chicagoans don't even know where that is, uh, or Roseland. And so uh, we need to also come to terms with the map of Chicago and to offer a special attention to folks who are in that periphery, right? That we have forgotten for a long time. And, uh, and one thing that I encourage everybody, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this artist called uh, Tonika Johnson. She's a photographer. Uh, and I see there's fans in the group that, that like uh, Tonika, she, she's worked with us a couple of times. She has a project called the Folded Map. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go to her website. And Folded Map is about folding the map of Chicago, right? And when you fold it, uh, if you live like me in the 6100 block north, you would meet in the map the 6100 south resident. In my case, that's somebody that lives in El Englewood that I have no idea about because we don't go to neighborhoods in Chicago. So the, the goal of the program is to get to know those twin residents or twin neighborhoods. And so I encourage everyone to do that. So if we, do this, if we did that more often, communities like Roseland and Washington Heights would be better known and would have more access to that type of power. But the reality is that they don't. So by connecting to Elevated, by connecting to the plan, we are elevating their voices and we are making 95th state be as hot spot of a spot as the uh, West Loop or Lincoln Park uh, are. And I don't know if this is answering all or some of your uh, questions. No, yeah, thank you. That, that was a great answer. I think, uh, as you point out, there are lots of different challenges. Um, so yeah, thank you. Anybody else have um, any anything else to raise? I had kind of a sideways question, uh, Newton, both for you and for for you, Roberto. Um, you know, it it is entirely likely that at least some of the people who are on this call are uh, undergraduate students at the University of Chicago who are, at least in the back of their minds, anxious about what they're going to write a BA thesis or do kind of a major senior capstone research project on. Um, as folks who have been sort of deeply immersed in this project, if, if, if one is passionate about and excited about supporting this work, what are some of the, to your minds, kind of underexplored research questions or, or maybe data sets that are out there that would maybe elevate 
pun not intended, sorry about that, that would maybe carry this work forward for you uh, or, or be contributive to, to the work that you're trying to do, but that you guys just haven't had the bandwidth to look at yet. Is there anything you could kind of direct curious minds towards uh, inquiring about or places we could start to support your work? Yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. And I'm going to give a priority in answering first to Newt in case she has some local needs at the Green Lion South community table, because I sure have a ton of ideas for the overall elevator. Sure, I'll, I'll be brief um, and, and I'll um, plug arts and culture um, and uh, really focusing on um, um, how arts, uh, the arts, uh, you know, particularly as demonstrated uh, during the pandemic and through the uprisings that we're seeing, um, how um, access to the arts and uh, ability for folks to be able to express through the, uh, through artistic medium um, is a re really allowing our humanity to, to be able to shine through in spite of everything. Um, how does that relate to transit? Well, you know, allowing for um, not only housing to be close to transit, but um, a, sort of encouraging um, cultural institutions to also be um, enmeshed in, um, you know, our residential zoning. One of the things that's uh, really unnerving um, for a lot of institutions or, or, you know, coming from institutions, but really trying to create um, um, space and place for uh, neighbors to be able to work together on um, different, uh, in different ways, whether it be performance or visual art, is uh, actually comes up against a very logistical issue of zoning. You know, we can't have um, a certain types of um, um, activities, public activities in um, places where uh, it's zoned, as Roberta made the point earlier, either single family or um, a lower density. So um, th those things actually enmesh really, really closely. Um, and then it's an uphill battle to try to change those and then have a you know variance. And I've been through those uh, processes and it costs a lot of money um, in, in because of people's time uh, that has to go to towards you know convincing the city that um, you know what we want to do is not you know detrimental to um, a lower density neighborhood. So um, that's just one example. There's a lot of little tentacles in there. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nod. Uh, so all of that, and also um, if you look at the recommendations in the plan, there's 36 of them, and each of them is going to require some sort of research, some of them light research, some of them deeper research. So I am already working with our consultant in figuring out where the capacity needs are going to be in projects like um, a, an analysis of vacant land and strategies to um, uh, turn vacant land near transit into uh, more transit oriented um, options than they are right now. I'm thinking about the pilots that we're going to launch next year. These are specific projects and as you all know there is never enough funding to do the, the research and the documentation of those or even to compare uh, a pilot in the north and the west and the south sides. That would be a very cool project uh, to undertake. Um, it, we always have needs to uh, find best practices in other cities and while we find uh, sometimes what we need, uh, one thing that uh, you probably know uh, the U.S. and Chicago in particular can be sometimes a bit parochial in finding uh, examples, so finding some global city examples that could be applicable to Chicago, that type of international connection, I find it very much missing often in the conversation, as well as comparison what we call sister neighborhoods and sister cities, right? Like um, our friends in LA, San Francisco, Denver, Memphis, Atlanta, they are doing cool projects too, but we often don't have the connectivity to compare maybe two or three of those sites or bring those sites together in a paper or in a document or in a, or in a piece like that. So, so tons of ideas and I would say, um, uh, to your question, Chris, to go to our 36 recommendations and maybe look at the ones that you feel closer to because the chances are that we're going to need help uh, with implementing that and definitely our consultants 
and the folks doing the research and the more academic work uh, are always going to be welcome to find a partner in somebody writing their thesis. Could I just follow up on that real quick? Chris, it was a great question because, um, you know, as a faculty, I come across students on a daily basis looking for research projects. And I'm just wondering if, um, is, is this the list you just uh, rattled off? Is there any kind of um, document or place on your website where you might keep track of ID research needs as they come across your desk or, or uh, yeah? We don't, but I would love to have a conversation about this with um, our consultants to at the table. Because while we don't have a formal list, I know that they are already preparing for the implementation part of this. So this is something that uh, you'll have time to uh, to have an offline conversation with. I'd love to, to do that. And maybe with uh, with her at the table, this elite consultant, Maria Zimmerman, uh, in, and the folks on the city, we could identify some of those. Yeah, Roberto, let's make that happen. Um, there's actually a network of folks who do work fairly similar to the job that I do at the university uh, at other institutions here in the city that I'm in touch with. And I, I know that a lot of them have already been a part of this process, but sometimes it's just a matter of connecting kind of the right people in the right kind of meta position. So let's let's definitely, if you can linger for just a minute after this conversation, let's do that. Um, Great. I, we are, we're already at 11 a.m. Uh, and I, I promised folks that we would keep this to about an hour. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. As a reminder, the comment period for the policy plan closes on the 29th, uh, that's next week. However, um, you know, between now and then, I know everyone would very much appreciate student comments. I'm in the middle of reading the plan myself and certainly intend to offer comments uh, before we're done. Uh, the link, thank you, Newt, is in the, uh, the chat. I also put a link to a website that does not yet exist, but uh, by the end of the day, we will have a web page devoted to this conversation, as well as some of the supplemental resources that were mentioned, including Janika Johnson's fabulous folded map project. Um, that will be posted to the Chicago Studies website. Uh, the link will be chicagostudiesuchicago.edu slash events slash ETOD. Um, so look for that a little bit later today. I'll send that link out by email to everyone who registered for this conversation today. Again, thanks so much for joining. Uh, for those of you who are interested in continuing along this vein, there is actually another Chicago Studies event a little bit later today. Uh, at 1230, we'll be hosting a conversation between um, Clarice and Associates Executive Director uh, Angela Herlock, who's based in Southeast Chicago, and uh, Felicia Dawson from Preservation of Affordable Housing in Woodlawn. They're gonna talk in particular about their collaboration on the redevelopment of the South Chicago YMCA, um, which has been a really successful development project uh, that's been underway for a few months and that no one's heard about because it's not conflicted. So, um, if you want to learn more about neighborhood driven community development, check us out at 1230. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris and everyone. Thank you, everybody. Guys, that was amazing. <laughs> that was so great. I Wow. Um, we, we, were, we were asked to do this as kind of a boutique program for a, just a, a handful of classes. And, and it truly breaks my heart because I want everyone to have, have been a part of that conversation. Fortunately, thanks to the, the wonders of the internet, which I should probably stop recording on. Hang